Hey everybody! Well, everybody, thank you. I'm Russ Qualia. The um, this is our fourth one, and we designed these things to share with people what we were doing at Quiza and so on. And when we came up with the schedule almost six months ago, the whole point of doing these was I was going to be in the office. Sue Hopper, who many of you have been in contact with at least via Shindig and other things, um, she was going to be there with me, and Mickey was going to be in town. And so far, we have transmitted these from the Middle East, California, Florida. And um, today, with the mittens and the hat, I'm going to turn this. I don't know if you can see outside or the flag flying. I am actually in Canada. So, so much for my great planning of making sure that we're doing these from my office all the time. The hat is not special effects or the sweater. It's because I'm actually freezing. So, um, so. I want to talk a little bit about what we've been up to over the past month, and then I want to bring in our special guest, which I can't even tell you how I am to have, to have Gavin here. Um, but first about stuff that we're doing at Quiza, some, some really cool stuff, actually. Just got done speaking um, at the LCEEQ here in Montreal, their annual conference, and it went well. We talked about student voice uh, and teacher voice. Dr. Landy was here. She talked about teacher voice, obviously. And um, just amazing to me, the response that we continually get. Um, been invited most recently to do some work in Hong Kong that we haven't done before, kind of came out of the blue, which was which is always sweet. Um, three giant milestones, uh, interestingly enough, all happened in this past two weeks. Usually these kind of milestones when it comes to books happen once or twice in a career, but interestingly enough, we had three of them in just two weeks, as I said. The principal voice speak went to final edit, which is kind of nice. Um, the teacher voice book that I'm actually writing with, with Lisa Landy, who will come up in a little bit, um, that book actually went to um, Corwin Press today. And last week, um, the third book, Aspire Higher, um, co authored by Mickey Corso and Christine Fox, and our guest, Gavin Dyke, went um, off to. Um, to the editor just last week. So that's, that's pretty amazing, actually. And I'm looking forward to having a bit of a hiatus from writing and then um, just was asked and want to actually do some work with some people may know out there, Ray and Julie Smith, and uh, around leadership voice. So that, that'll be kind of fun. So that's the scoop from our end. Um, I apologize. I know we have lots of people in the field here um, that signed on. I want you to know this is kind of cool. We've got seven different countries represented that signed up for this, 14 different states. What I have learned from these in the past is that um, the timing is not great for everyone since this is the middle of the night for some people that watch this. So after we do these, they get picked up and transmitted all over the place. So I might have 20, 30 people now, but in, that, in essence, it, it grows exponentially as we do these. So. Um, a couple other quick updates. The work continues on the K2, uh, or the K3, actually, the pre-K uh, to grade 3, H3 to grade 3. I don't get this title right. H3 to grade 3, work that we're doing with the National Association of Elementary School Principals. That report should be out the end of next month, as a matter of fact. We have some prelim preliminary data that we've collected. Uh, it's really exciting, actually, to, to get a handle um, what is happening at such an early age of um, around student voice. The other piece, uh, and we'll have more on that actually the next time we're together. The other piece that we're exploring and we'll be doing actually a workshop in Los Angeles next Saturday is around parent voice. It's something I debate in my own mind. What do I mean by parent voice or do I want parents to have a voice or more of a whisper or, or what? Um, I do know parents do have an influence over student voice. And so that's what we'll be exploring next week in Los Angeles. So um, without further ado, I want to bring my guest up on stage and talk to somebody who is just somebody I, I've known for a long time, um, but admire and respect. I respect him um, in his work, but most importantly, I, I respect him as a, as a person. He, um, he's an inspiration to me, quite frankly. And every time I talk to him, I get excited because he's one of the I'm fortunate. I have a handful of people that I can talk to, and every time I talk to a group of people like Gavin, um, I leave there smarter, quite frankly, and it, he makes me think differently about the world around me. 
He is the um, director of the Education World Summit, which I've asked him to speak about today. Uh, but he's also the co-director of the Asia Asian Summit on Education and Skills, co-founder of um, Education Fast Forward. He um, He's a consultant. He is just a, a genius extraordinaire and one of our co-authors of the new book, Aspire Higher. So I could actually spend the next 40 minutes talking about his accolades and how much he means to me both personally and professionally. Um, but without further ado, Gavin, welcome. Thank you very much, Russ. And it's great to speak to you. Thanks. The feelings Thanks. are mutual, you know. I think I change each time I speak to you. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I, you know, I got to, to meet Gavin years ago and met him at a coffee shop through a mutual friend that said the two of you need to get together. And, um, and we did get together. Uh, when we first got together, interesting enough, Gavin had long hair like me. Um, no. <laughs> Certainly um, not. Not even a beard. Not even a beard. <laughs> That's right, even a beard. Um, but Gavin is from England, actually, and um, lives outside I, of London. I'd like to stop you there, Russ. I'm, I'm, I'm not from England. But, I know. Uh, you know what? You can the, carry on. This, I, the, the second I said that, I knew I was going to be in trouble. He is from Scotland. I want to be clear about that. Uh, yes, the second that came out of my mouth, I know that was right. He is from Scotland, lives outside of London, though, about an hour outside of London, and um, is actually one of the people that actually voted for Scotland to leave England. I think, no, I didn't want to put that in his mouth either. Um, but, but Gavin, again, thank you. It, it really is. It's an honor to have you here, but also to, to be a friend, quite frankly. Um, could you tell us, um, I think, one of the things we try to do in these, these, um, these situations is just share what's going on out there in the field and then I'm going to have them ask you some questions and then I'll bring Lisa Landy up to get, kind of get us up to speed on teacher voice but the education world forum was just a few weeks ago now I guess maybe a month or so ago could you tell us kind of what was the highlight what what happened I mean it's exciting I should, should give a little bit of background it, it's a, a meeting of ministers of education primarily that's taken place for now that was the 13th this time, and uh, I've been the program director for that in, over the, the last 12 years, covering these 13 events. <clears throat> and uh, so we, in, in the event, just by numbers, we had 81 ministers of education take part in it this time around. We had 97 countries participate or be represented. Uh, and uh, over, or yes, over 700 people there all so when you include all the um, the experts, the contributors in different ways. Uh, number one, uh, or the aim of the event is to bring ministers of education together, not so that they can make pronouncements about how wonderfully they all are doing, but to share uh, their challenges, to share what's going on in terms of their policy making, and to uh, hopefully be able to learn from each other through that sharing and actually perhaps develop collaborations with each other and with some of the other people there. Mm. So it's not a, a, a stage for grandstanding, it's a stage for working together and learning from each other. If I was to take some things uh, out of it, I think um, maybe I should say first, the, um, the themes that we had set this year were, uh, were around first, what are the literacies that we require as our based uh, so what should we be working on first? And it's very easy to talk about traditional literacy or digital literacy, but are there other things? With the announcement of UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, is there something which might be something to do with sustainability literacy? Some people are talking about that. Some people are, are, are talking about the uh, li literacy for learning. What have we? How much effort have we really put into learning how to learn? And I think a lot of us agree that that's a very important part of what we should be doing with learning. It's not just um, learning something; it's actually being able to learn quickly and respond quickly to new situations. If there was something that encapsulated that for me, it was uh, one of the sessions that we held was focusing on education in emergencies. We all know the challenges that are faced around the world and, and, and extraordinary challenges. When you begin to look at the numbers, and uh, I'm not going to jump to the numbers now, but they can be looked up very quickly. The, uh, the number of children who are working in 
precarious circumstances or the circumstances of danger and for whom education is a really critical component of their uh, of their lives is an extraordinary number and it's 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 wonderful the work that has been done and the responsibility that has been taken by some countries in order to support that uh, but what apart from just the fact that that's going on what can we learn from how they are behaving what can we take from it the oecd just so it's not just put into a, a, a developing countries context the oecd has recently produced a report on uh, the performance and influence of immigrant children in different countries and how that affects the existing systems in which they're working so there's a whole set of things happening in that kind of area so the second strand of my themes would be uh, was the skills that we need for life and skills that we need for uh, vocations so just to begin to uncover the skills one of my concerns is that I, there's a false dichotomy going on between the skills arguments and 21st century skills and the basic knowledge that we need to begin with which is why mm. I had both things represented but we need to work harder on skills and some of the discussions that I'm personally having along these lines are uh, what is the whole package that we need what's the knowledge skills and behaviors some people will call them character uh, mm. some people will call them values some people will call them other things and how do you uh, how do you construct these together and get them working for you uh, one of the questions that come up in that context and I'll put it to you Russ so we'll put you on the spot here um, if you had three words to describe your favorite teacher mm. of all time what would those three words be wow um i guess caring I'd, I'd want them to make sure that they cared about me um the second one would this won't surprise you is listen i want them to yep. listen what i had to say because i think i had something to say and then the third one would be open um, I'd want them to be open with me about, you know, taking some learning. So, yeah, the very first thing would be important that they care. The second thing that they'd be willing to listen and the third one would be that they'd be open to hear what I had to say. That I'd, doesn't surprise uh, you, does it? It doesn't really surprise me. And I, I'm glad I asked you. I, I was worrying about it for a moment. But the, the, if, if you take those, which of those falls into the box, which is knowledge, which falls into the box, which is skills, and which mm. falls into the box, which is behaviors? Yeah, that's really it's an interesting. interesting reflection. Uh, so uh, I, I know one or two countries that are particularly working on that whole behavioral strand, picking out yeah. of that. I, I know one or two professions, for example, the nursing profession has looked very closely at that, certainly in this country. So yeah. just uncovering that and thinking about what that mean, might mean for the way we develop the teaching profession, uh, yeah. the way we develop children, uh, the way to develop ourselves is, is, is something worth doing. And you know, the third, oh, sorry, yeah. I was going to la the last strand of this. I'm sorry, yeah. I've taken a long time. Is, no, no, go ahead, uh, go to the third one. Enterprise and entrepreneurship. So I think if you, if you get those two components of uh, knowledge and skills or behaviors or whatever they are, and then you go take on to the next strand, look into the future and how we need to build the economies uh, and yeah. successful economies actually give people purpose and opportunity in life. Actually moving yeah. towards enterprise is the way I would propose we go. Yeah. God, I love that. I tell you, you know, it's interesting, and, and this isn't going to surprise anyone that hears it now or, or hears it later. All three of those themes are obviously interrelated um, yeah. from, from the literacy piece to the knowledge and skills piece, and certainly to the entrepreneurial piece. I'll tell you what I love about what you just asked me to do. What a great exercise that would be for other teachers to do uh, with their students or even with parents. Because, you know, I could see somebody saying, um, you know, they'd want the teacher to know the subject matter. And yeah, of course, but I can't imagine they would have three knowledge points and not any behavioral or skill points. That's and right. They, so they, put that they, in perspective. That's right. The, 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 the expertise part is expected. Yeah, uh, and and I think by people who talk about the caring part and all the rest of it, that's kind of presumed. Yeah. But it's not enough just to have that. Yeah. And if you're a good yeah. professional, I think you think about these other things. 
and you personalize no, I, and behave that way. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because I think you hit that on the head, and I think that speaks to our work. It, there are some presumptions we make that are wrong, quite frankly. Um, but you're right. I, I would presume that my teacher, by nature of being a teacher, already knows the content. Um, yeah. So what do I want my favorite teacher? Well, I assume they're already going to know the content. That's not my issue. That's their issue. But at least show me the kind of the personalization to it. Gavin, take a minute, because I know you know the student voice work. Obviously, we just wrote that book together um, and the aspirations work. And to use your term, which quite frankly, I like better than our term, learner voice. How do you see learner voice from an international perspective? Because as you know, we've got schools now um, in the Middle East. We have schools in England. We've got schools will be doing work in Sweden. Most recently now in Hong Kong, which I haven't even shared with you because I just found this out this week. Um, we've got schools all over the world. But from your perspective, from, you know, from education fast forward to the work you do in the Far East and in India and certainly the Educational World Forum, where do you see these connections between student voice or uh, in the current work? Like, can you share with us some examples that you see this really working in some foreign countries that people that are online right now typically would not see? That's putting you on the spot now. I shall, I'll have a question for you again in a minute. <laughs> I, I think, uh, I mean, I do see examples of it. Um, I think perhaps probably the critically important thing is that there are examples of it, but it is not as widespread as it, as it might be. Yeah. And I think the, the thing that really concerns me and the organizations that I, and I'll come to an organization in a moment that really does do work in this way, um, the organizations that really look at that are, and are concerned and really want to push learner voice forward are ones that recognize that we are doing an extraordinary job of throwing away the enterprise, the uh, creativity, the energy, uh, the possibilities and the potential of young people uh, because we uh, because we created an industrialized model. Now, the industrialized model did some very good Good things. I took education to wider audience than it was ever before, but I don't think it's uh, we can we can move on from that. And I think learner voice takes you to a position where you're beginning to uncover where children are. And you, I, we've talked about this before, Russ. I, I I've, I'm still going after the view that you start with learner voice. If you develop a learner voice, you then have the confidence to become an emergent leader. And if you're an emergent leader, that means you step in when you have ideas that you think are relevant for the moment. It's not having a badge saying I'm I'm in charge. It's actually right. stepping in when it's appropriate and then stepping back again. If yep. you're an emergent leader and you get confidence in that, then you can move on to enterprise. And if you look at what has been said about the economies of the world today, what we need is not employees who will just do a repetitive task, but employees when, when they're of big companies uh, uh, who will be creative and attack their jobs in a creative way in order to develop them and create new and further opportunities and new and further business. Yeah. Now, if they're, if they're not fortunate enough to work in an organization like that, then the next step on is that there is huge opportunity in terms of creation of social enterprise and commercial enterprise. If you look at the movement of the startup community and the importance of that to economies of countries, including the United States and the United Kingdom and many, many others, I think that is growing in importance and growing as an opportunity. So actually instilling that, uh, that enterprise comes to me from actually working on learner voice from the beginning, building on that, giving people confidence to come up with ideas, being able to voice those ideas, test those ideas, and then take them through to creative thought and working in a creative way. I got to tell you, you're just, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm always like in awe, whether I'm sitting next to you having a cappuccino or I'm sitting here in a different country just saying, there goes Gavin again. It's just, uh, it's just a treat. It's a treat to hear you talk and it's going to be so obvious from the audience that here's this in our demonstration sites that I we'll hear you a lot. Some of that makes sense. No, you're just you're an amazing thought leader. Just it's so deep. What I want to do now, Gavin, it's like around 25 after. What I want to ask um, the people that are on, I would like to um, to give them 
five minutes. Five minutes to either group yourself up to something or come up with a question for, for Gavin or myself. Um, but this is an amazing opportunity to ask a world leader uh, that's got his pulse on countries from all over the world, literally all over the world, um, to ask. So let's come back. Um, Zach, if we can kind of get people into their groups, we'll bring them back at, let's say, 331. It's 326 right now. Let's bring them back in five minutes. And Gav, if you could hang with us for another 15 minutes, I'm sure we'll have some questions. How's that? That's good. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Everybody, think of some questions. Okay. Um, wow. Gavin, are you impressed with the timeliness of this? 331, back on? It's pretty impressive. That was very good. Yeah. Um, and I got to talk to Sue during the break. Um, I've had two people actually um, give me some questions, which is great. And people can do that. At, it's at Dr. D-R-R-U-S-S-Q. Um, so feel free to do that if you want to. T two people actually already did. But if you've got a question now, if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, where those of you see a little hand that says raise your hand or ask a question, click on that and we can bring you up and you can ask us directly or I can go right to the other questions. But take a minute. Anybody want to ask something directly or talk to either one of us directly? They're very frightening people to talk to, so I don't blame you if you're shy. Anybody? Well, while they're working up courage to ask questions, let me share with you the two questions I did get um, tweeted. Yeah, this, talk about this is putting you on the spot. Can you share with us the most progressive country you've worked with and why? <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it's not England or America. <laughs> <laughs> well, the really tough part of that question is I've never, well, I have worked with whole countries allegedly, but of course you work with people and you uh, you don't work with countries and right. it's about progressive groups of people uh, and i've seen that in, in different areas they're not always about the the national education system the example i was going to mention earlier was in near bangalore in india mm. uh, Kupam and rush you know the agastya foundation international foundation and their mission was to make it, uh, their nation a, a nation of curious children mm. Uh, to develop the curiosity of children, and they have uh, done some extraordinary things in, uh, in seeking to build that. Mm -hmm. So they, they first they thought they would set up a few schools. They decided against doing that, and in the end, they took low-cost um, science experiments out to the villages of India in the backs of um, trucks. And <clears throat> and you might think, well, that, yeah, that's interesting, but that's going to be pretty small. Uh, through those means, they were reaching, when I last looked at figures, they were reaching about 2 million children a year. Wow. Uh, so it, it became an extraordinarily well-organized, well-run uh, piece of education. And it was because in the villages of India, the, the opportunities for doing uh, work and, and that learning around science and doing it practically rather than just being told about it uh, mm -hmm. that work was limited and so they mm -hmm. created that they then moved on to develop a young instructor leaders program because they discovered that some of those young children working in those circumstances were great at actually encouraging the other children around them so the young instructors Le leader program is all about those uh, children who display that uh, desire and propensity to to support them in getting out and supporting their classmates around them. So all that kind of thing is very much along the lines of learner voice, um, student voice, and yeah. making that work and doing it practically, but reaching two million children a year. That's, I mean, yeah, and look it, at, well, if you look up the Agastya Foundation, you'll see some fantastic examples of that, but happening in the rural part of India. I just read something earlier today, just, just, just on that, I read something earlier today, which was about uh, how uh, in, in the, uh, in, as the world globalizes, the children in the cities of New York have, have less in common with rural, uh, people in rural conditions in the United States than they have with people in other cities around the world. There's something also about that rural challenge 
that I think Agastia has done something really special with and could be spread wow. to other countries where rural, rural issues are important. Yeah. yeah, can you just spell the name of that foundation so people can look it up? Is it A, God, you can just, can you spell it's it, please? A, a G, uh, you can translate for me, A-G-A-S-T-Y-A, -A, Agastia. A-G-A-S-T-Y-A, pretty much sounds like English, like it does in Scottish, I think. <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's amazing. I think, you know, as I'm thinking about this, about the rural piece, it's funny, this would be for another conversation, but I'm, I'm getting that same kind of sense from really urban, urban areas. And when I yep. mean urban, I'm, I'm not talking about the, I don't know, the middle kind of busyness, like the Pittsburgh or the Bostons of the world. But when I think of the New York City, Chicago's and LA's that we're in now, it, it reminds me of rural America where rural kids only see this piece of the puzzle. You know, they, they can't get out of, they can't see past where they're from. I got to tell you, I see the exact same thing in, in LA neighborhoods where they can't see past where that neighborhood where yeah. they're from. I think um, we, I think we should be thinking more cleverly or wisely about uh, just how we put things together. I do know just when when I'm doing the Education World Forum, and um, one of the things I learned very early on was to, uh, when I was talking to a, a, the, the minister from a country, look, uh, and you're wanting to get him to share, find somebody that there's something to share with, go yeah. looking for the countries that are of a similar size. So yeah, there's something good. about the, the way the pack, it, it, you get the similarities and we can understand because the the administration need to make a, a, a an education system work where you have four million people is different from that when you have twenty million, which is different yeah. from when you have four hundred thousand. Wow. So, Gavin, listen. I think you brought this question on yourself because here is another one I just got. Can you? And you don't have to answer this. Um, who is the most progressive minister of education you know right now? <laughs> Well, there are a few. I, I the, the, well, there's a cheap answer here, which is often the most progressive ministers are the one who's just left their jobs, and yeah. it's and it's like if you think about some of the people do, running big foundations in the United States, uh, yeah. what they were doing when they were in post and what they did when they came out of their post and started to have to spend their money as it yeah. were, on things to do with charity, then you really see where they stand and what they, what they, what they want to achieve in life. When right. they're in their post, they're constrained by uh, a whole gamut of things. Uh, yeah. you know, for example, I, I mean, one of the sections that we do is we have a, a thing um, in the World Forum where I'm looking at constructing cases for investment in education because they have to um, make their case against the minister who's in charge of health, who's in charge of defense, who's in charge of uh, you know, every other part. And so that they're working in a circumstance which doesn't make them all powerful, but makes them uh, have to create, I suppose, political arguments. Uh, and, and I suppose what I'm trying to do with this is help them do that. So there are progressive people, but in a sense, uh, catching them Catching them uh, not off guard, but catching them where they're able to speak openly is yeah. what's critical about it, and and that's the kind of circumstance we seek to set in the mm. world forum. Noticing, of course, well, that I've, I've of course avoided answering the question. Well, I, and I'm not going to let you think because I think that was a very good, very think thought provoking answer, and I would expect no less from you. But here's an opportunity to give one person some kudos. Which minister would you give kudos to? It's not like we're going to broadcast this all over the world. Oh, but wait, we are. Um, <laughs> is there one that just jumps? No, seriously. Is there one that just jumps out at you and says, holy, oh, what an amazing, and, and I get it. I, there's 87 of them. I, I was there. I've been fortunate enough to, been the, to, to participate three times, and it is. It's, a, or it's an amazing experience. Well, but is there somebody it, right it, now that jumps out? I, let me, I, I'm going to kind of handle this a slightly different way. I, I, when you, if you look at the um, 
the figures in, and forgive me, and I hope the ministers of these countries forgive me, if you look at Lebanon and Jordan, and the population of those countries, and how the number of students in those countries has swelled by maybe 40%, maybe 50, oh, more than that, more like 75%, because of the circumstances in which they find themselves. And yet they have fought to uh, maintain the education systems in these shocking circumstances yeah. where they are dealing with so many refugees and people who are coming in. That deserves a medal from somewhere. That's extraordinary. I think you. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the more privileged parts of the world where the uh, there is more going on, I think I, I'm often drawn to Scandinavia because there are uh, some great things going on there. But I think a lot of that is around the whole trust between politics and society, and where there is a level of trust and understanding or better trust. It's never 100 yeah. percent of course but where there's yeah. better trust then there is the opportunity to do more things which are more creative and take things forward and you know for years i've been and russ you've witnessed this i've been really excited about the danish development which is to do with um having access to the internet during high stakes exams now that's a, a that's been done working with the population of teachers with the population of students with parents uh, in order to take that forward. I think that's a, a very exciting development. And the, but the, to be honest, uh, there are in different countries and different parts of the world, uh, lots of examples which are along those kinds of lines. Um, yeah. So I think it, it wouldn't be nice to have an Oscar or a, some sort of award uh, which was recognizing, not, not a money oriented one, but one right. which is recognizing the courage and the heroism of some of those people are taking some of these big things forward. Uh, you know, yeah, first, thank you. Thanks for being so honest and, and open about that. I, I love hearing that. I mean, I, I think you're right. Those people deserve those kind of recognition. Just thinking off the top of my head, um, you know what? You'd be the person that could award that maybe at the next Education World Forum. <laughs> um, recognize those people with the biggest challenges and give them some kind of award. That would be pretty cool. Um, recognizing those with effort. If anyone can do it, you can. But again, I, I appreciate your openness and honesty with it. I'm going to bring up, ask Lisa Landy to come up, give us a quick update on Teacher Voice Gavin. If you could stay with like for five more minutes, I'm going to kick it back to you for a final word. Um, I know it's getting late in England, and again, so appreciative. But um, Zach, could you bring up Lisa? And I'm going to ask Lisa to kind of share with us some updates of what's going on with Teacher Voice. Okay, Lisa, yours. Welcome. All right, thanks, Ray. Is the audio on? Are we good? All right. Well, as um, as Russ just mentioned, we were able to spend some time with the EQ group in Quebec, and um, definitely need to give a shout out to John Ryan and Ainsley Rose and the other folks who are part of organizing that that event and that learning community, I've got to tell you, it was a group of a couple hundred teachers and educators that were so incredibly engaged in such an impressive way in their own professional learning and um, just really incredible conversations um, and really interested in a thing that Russ had to share about student voice and really engaged in talking about their voice and how they can use their voice as teachers to make meaningful change at the classroom level and um, in the building and policy level as well. It was a, a, really, a real privilege to learn with them. On March 10th, we have our first Teacher Voice Symposium that we're organizing in partnership with Southern New Hampshire University. So if anybody listening in is, uh, lives on the east coast of the United States and is interested in that event, I'll put a registration link in the chat feature for the whole room. I think there's still a few slots left, but we'll have a, a really incredible group of people that are coming together to talk about issues around teacher voice. Um, Lisa Shaw from Coral Press, Peter DeWitt, who writes the Common Ground blog for Education Week, um, and Mickey Corso, Russ will be there, Brian Connolly from the Quiza team. So there'll be a great group of people there. We're going to come together and, and really do some collaborative learning, taking a look at different data points around teacher voice and and do, do some collective learning. So I think that's going to be a great day. And if anybody has interest, we'd love to, to hear from you. 
And then I thought I would just quickly share a couple of highlights from the last month of the teacher voice work with the that, that we're working with because I know one of the things we want to try and do on these webinars is to connect people and their practice in different sites that are maybe working on similar things. So if any of these three things that I want to highlight are resonating with anybody else listening and you'd like to get connected with other teachers and leaders around the world who are working on similar issues, uh, reach out and let us know. But one site at a high school that I'm working with right now, um, they had a session and, and the topic of the day was actually purpose around the, the guiding principles. And what they really got to talking about was their frustration as teachers with matching their purpose and the reason why they got into education and the things that they're really passionate about teaching their students. And then the current grading practices that they feel somewhat stifled by right now. And those teachers stayed for, I think, about an hour after the session ended and they really started to take a hard look at their grading practices. And they're working on adopting a, a mentality or a mindset, as Carol Dweck would talk about, as part of a mindset work on not yet. And they're really starting to transform the way that they're looking at grading. It's a, a pretty powerful thing that's happening there with these teachers using their voices to, to talk about um, how they evaluate and look at student work and how they support them in the effort of maintaining mastery, not just, um, not just grades. So that's one really exciting thing happening. Um, there's another school, a middle school that we're working with. They identified out of their teacher voice data that they've got some massive communication issues. And as they got together and did some additional focus groups and then brought all of the data back with their leadership team, what they discovered is that they actually have lots of really great channels for communication available. They've got amazing structures. Their problem is in usab user usability. People are not using the structures that they have available. And so they're devising some really fun plans in a way that they can, um, in a way that they can use humor and and really engage with their staff and trying to get them to use the structures that are available so that they can increase their level of effective communication in their building. And then the last one, and um, as we talk about leaders and really sharing our practice, putting our practice out there for others to learn from. Uh, Janet Avery, who we've talked about before, she's in Jerome School District in Idaho. She recently gave a keynote to another district. It was a, a stretch out of her comfort zone as well. And the way she organized her keynote was around the guiding principles of self-engagement and purpose and how those three things are really applying to her life as a leader and the way that she's organizing professional learning for the teachers that she's leading. So again, just a few highlights from this month and the sites that we're working with. And um, we'd love to connect with others who are working on similar things or other things that they want to connect. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Um, you're always there, ready to go. I appreciate it. Uh, just so others know that that are online, um, the rest of the team is actually literally in schools right now as we're speaking. Are they be online? Mickey is actually in Montana. Chris and Brian are in Oklahoma City, and Susan is in South Carolina. Or at least that's where they tell me they are. Um, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that's right. Um, but they all said their regards for sure. But Lisa, thank you. Thanks for, for coming through for sure. Um, before, if we can bring Gavin back up. Zach, again, thanks, Lisa. Uh, if we can bring Gavin back up. And then also, Zach, you could take me up. We've got three more questions. And Gavin, our goal is to answer these three questions in the next few minutes. Um, let Gavin back up. If you could bring in, can you bring, take me off, Zach, and bring Alex up, please? Alex, I think we have a video question for Hello, can you hear me? I can. I can. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Alex Bell. I'm based in London, and I'm an ex head teacher with a startup business called Immert Immersive Democracy. Now, the concept of immersive democracy is to try and flatten the hierarchies, we, which we've got in, in British schools at the moment, and I think I recognise in, in schools I work with uh, worldwide. So, Gavin, the question for you is really, who is uh, leading uh, worldwide on this issue of trying to flatten the hierarchies in schools, and who can I learn from with this project? I, it's an interesting question because there are all sorts of places in which um, top down, of course, is a, a, a particular way of behaving, both within schools and within the system as a whole. I, if I. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to make Yeah, and I think the. <clears throat> I, where. 
it varies. There are elements of it in a number of different countries. Uh, and uh, I, I see examples of it in different schools where the leadership of schools are. I think one of the issues is for, if we're talking about schools within a school, is that uh, there's, I once worked for the innovation unit with as part of the government in the in United Kingdom, in England. When I was working for the innovation unit, we did, had a thing called Power to Innovate, which was about the uh, being able to, you remember it, being able to suspend uh, education law for a period of up to three years if it was standing yes. in the way of the success of your students. Uh, when the applications came in from teachers to the innovation unit, which was a letter to the minister, 90% of those applications or a figure around that were entirely unnecessary. So what was happening was people were being there were obstacles to that flattening or to other things that they might like to do uh, yes. when there was no obstacle. The unit had in the end to write to them and say, go ahead, just do it. Because actually there was no law. People were restricting themselves because there was a fear of stepping into the unknown. So my first argument is, is always about taking action ourselves. I would, you know, part of the action would be uh, take courage and uh, permission. Uh, check, you don't, you don't always have to have permission, but also mm. actually live that out in the way that you work with the children within the school as well. Thank you very much. My pleasure. You? Alex and, and thanks Gavin. That, I can tell you it's way awesome having you answer these questions because that was a tough one. Uh, but Alex, <laughs> thank you. The, no, seriously, thank you for the insights. I think um, by saying that, I think I've lived my entire life by doing things and then asking permission, which can get you in trouble, but it moves an agenda. Um, it always moves an agenda. Let me ask you this. I get another question here from Patrick. Um, how do I, as an educator, introduce intrinsic value to student voice? How do I, as an educator, introduce intrinsic value to student voice? Yeah, what do you think? Good question. It's a good question. I mean, I, and I'm not sure whether I'm hitting it, whether I'm understanding intrinsic value, uh, but I, I think when you build it as a culture, mm. uh, the, the only way is forward. Uh, and, and the kind of example I would take from it is that I, I know of one school in the west of England, Bristol, where uh, they they thought actually it would be good if they got in touch with companies around the school to see if there was work that the students could do, uh, creative work that students could do for it. Now, when when they did this, what happened was that, uh, in fact, one of the big aircraft companies got in touch. There was a problem with jet engines. And cutting a long story quite short, basically the children came up with an answer to this problem with jet engines. And it is now built into the way the fans work in a jet engine in this company. So it's extraordinary the value that can be built in. And you just need a few examples of that kind of thing. And I think you begin to uh, associate the value, uh, something positive about what students contri uh, can contribute. I, I've seen that uh, in other countries too, where actually once you release the pent up uh, capability uh, and capacity for students to come up with creative ideas, to suggest things and to work with people outside, you'll find that there's a whole lot that's there that uh, we should be, <laughs> it just becomes ridiculous not to hear their voice, not to have them making a, a real contribution and making change and adding value to the communities in which, in which they live. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I certainly agree, 100% agree. I think another where I see the intrinsic value of student voice making a sense for the students is when they're not only allowed to share their voice, but you then hold them responsible for doing something with that voice. So I can, share my, I, can, I can share my opinion, but then I need to take responsibility for doing something about my opinion. And I think once you do that, to me, that builds in the intrinsic value as well. So if not, my voice is just somebody else that's chattering. But as well, soon yeah. as I hold you responsible for what you're saying, now it has intrinsic value to not only me, but it creates intrinsic value to your point, to the culture of the organization. Does that the, make sense? The, that does. And, and, and forgive me if I'm not understanding the, the way that uh, the question is posed in, 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 in any of this. But it, the other thing I would say of that is that the, there's a, a balancing point to that. If you ask students their opinions or if you ask parents their opinions, 
and just ignore it. Right. And so that there, uh, and maybe that is you know, part of the, the value again. That right. uh, I, I recall a thing some years back in Sheffield in the Midlands, and, and they asked what students would like to happen. And what students wanted to happen was there to be a no smoking policy in the in the Sheffield area, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at which they all took fright, and people backed off. They wouldn't mm -hmm. today, actually, funnily enough, because things right. have changed. But actually, the students were ahead of the game. They were wanting this to be moved along more quickly at that time. So that it's um, as has been said, and as the book might show a little bit of. It, mm -hmm. it, it, real engagement is not about engaging in a kind of, oh, yes, we've engaged sort of way. Real engagement is getting people involved, taking their opinions seriously, acting upon them ourselves, but also through that acting upon them, encouraging them, them to act on them too. So it's a shared yeah. responsibility, not an individual one. That's exactly right. God, I love that. Love it. Hey, one more question for you. We can answer it in just a minute. And it's actually from um, someone from England, Simon Feasy, who uh, actually Mickey's going to visit his school in, I think it's just a few weeks, maybe another month. Um, Simon has been, I've never met him personally, but I got to tell you, um, Simon, I, I hope you're still on. I, I just want to thank you for your commitment to this work. I, you're seriously, I, Mickey's talked so much to me about you. I've seen you on Twitter. Um, I've read some of the things that you've done. I just, I'm so appreciative of who you are and what you're about. I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you directly as well. Uh, but Simon has a question uh, for Gavin. Where are the best practices around aspirations exist in the UK? Wants to know <laughs> where best practices around aspirations exist in the UK. If that's not a setup question, I don't know what is. That um, seems to. <laughs> well, there's a little bit of me would be drawn very quickly to things called the Aspirations Academy, <laughs> academies, and uh, well, their uh, aspirations to be in front and central to the way that they have sought to operate and they are so that's that's a good starting point but i yeah. think the other part i think i i mean it is worth looking across because it's always worth drawing in where good things are happening and drawing on those experiences and that's really in a sense what i'm trying to do with things like the world forum because you're you never know where the good things come from and the wonderful thing about it is it frequently surprises you. It's not necessarily the, the riches or the greatest or the biggest. It's frequently in the small cases where you find that there is some absolutely diamond, uh, yeah. that is some diamond piece of work that is going on and that you can, uh, you can discover. So finding these small diamonds in amongst all, all what's going on is, is what we should do. And you get that by being open by looking yeah. further and not presuming anything of any of the schools that might deal with. Well, well said. What Gavin talked about is if you go to our website at qualiainstitute.org, um, just click on the, it's AAT, Operations Academies Trust, and they're doing some really good things. They, they, we have lots more work that needs to be done for sure. Um, but you know what, we're, we're trying to change a culture and that takes time. And, it always takes longer than I want it to take, but those schools are moving in the right direction. Some schools are moving quicker for sure. Um, but the bottom line is they've, they've got the right attitude. They've got the right beliefs, belief system. And um, we sent, we had some people from the U S in Sweden actually visit a couple of the schools in London and they were just blown away quite frankly, not by the, not by the building or by the fancy words on the side of the building around aspirations, but by talking, those kids, those kids had a sense of ownership and a sense of pride that they've never had before. And every time I go, I get all puddled. I just, just watching that come to fruition. So, Simon, I think and, and, that's, a, that's a good start. Yeah, and you're also building around that the, the, the human capacity in the teachers and the staff who are involved in it, all the staff of the school, uh, right. who actually understand what that means and actually will subscribe to it and support it and spread it. Yeah. Well. It's four o'clock. I want to thank Shindig for again doing this with us. Certainly Corwin for sponsoring this and allowing us to work with Shindig. But most importantly, to Gavin. Gavin, I'm telling you, you're a gift, an absolute gift to the, not only me as a friend, but a gift to all of us in education. So thank you for what you have done, continue to do, and all the great things that are, that lie ahead. And we're going to have one big party when that Aspire Hire book comes out with all of us. <laughs> we are. So, so thank you for everything.
Thank you, Russ, and thank you everybody who's listened in. And uh, I hope some of it has been of some interest. Uh, but Russ and everybody, keep warm. <laughs> I will for sure. Um, we'll make this available to people online, and we'll also make sure you get Gavin's contact information at Education Fast Forward, and um, you can contact him directly and follow him on Twitter. But we'll make all that stuff available to everyone. So again. Thanks, Gavin, and, and thanks, Sue Hopper, for making all this come together as you do so beautifully every month. Bye, everybody. Hopefully next time I'll be coming in from Cayman or someplace warm. Bye. <laughs> Bye.